1, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Once you get there, somebody say amen. All right. There's a couple people there. If you're not there yet, it should be on the screen over your head. I'm going to read one verse. We're going to pray and uh, dive, dive into a narrative from the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 1, or 15 rather, and verse 1. After these things... The word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, or unto Abram, rather. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Why don't we pray together this morning and ask God to be with us. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to open your word. I thank you, God, for this group of people that has gathered together with a hunger for your word. I pray, Lord, let your presence be in this room. I ask God, let every heart and every mind be open and ready to receive. Let your anointing rest upon my mouth this moment, God, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. There was a happening, there was a sequence of events that occurred immediately prior to this verse. And those events are found in the narrative in Genesis chapter 14. And we'll begin to work our way through that chapter and discuss a few points. And ultimately, we'll arrive at the thundering promise of Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. In four, chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, a bunch of names, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and several other names. And all of these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is in the Salt Sea, or which is the Salt Sea. Now, for 12 years they served Chador, Chador Laomer, And in the 13th year, they rebelled. You see, in my head, that sounded like it would flow much easier. But when you speak it out loud, apparently I need to practice some of these names before time. Uh, They served King Cheddar. Let's just go with that. Twelve years, they served Cheddar. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. Everybody all right with that? All right, fantastic. So you've got this group of kings. You've got this group of kings. Much of... The, the Middle Eastern and the, the Babylonian era, what we would understand as the cradle of civilization, the fertile crescent, uh, it, the geopolitical landscape is basically city-states. And these more powerful cities would begin to subjugate and make vassals out of the smaller cities around them. So there's this confederate of kings, and it's led by King Cheddar, and they're ruling over several other cities. They've made them their slaves. And so 12 years they served King Chedorlaomer. We're sticking with Cheddar. And then I thought I'd try it one more time. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. And in the 14th year came Cheddar and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims and Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims and Ham, and the Imims in Shavah, Kirathayim. Whew. And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by The wilderness. So he marshals his forces. He gets all of his confederate kings together. They arm all of their people and they they go in. It takes a little bit of time. It looks like everything's going well for the rebels. But ultimately, King Cheddar comes in and he fights against them. They returned, came to Emishaphat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites, which dwelt in Hezontamar. There went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adama and the king of Zoabim and the king of Bela, the same which is Zor. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim with Cheddar, king of Elam and Tidal, king of nations and their confederate kings. There are four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their victuals and went their way. 
And in verse 12, the Bible tells us they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. A couple chapters previously, we have read that Abraham and or Abram rather and Lot prior to God changing his name. They have been so greatly blessed by the Lord that the land can no longer support them dwelling together. And Abram gives his nephew grace and allows him to pick first where he would like to go. And the Bible records that Lot looked upon the well-watered plains of the Jordan and chose to go there. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 13 that he pitched his tent toward Sodom, but the kings and the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly in the eyes of God. Reading the events of chapter 14 makes Lot's decision even worse. He left his blessed uncle, his righteous uncle, his uncle who surely Lot knew had a call of God upon his life. He left his uncle to go live in a land that was in bondage to a foreign king. He chose his ultimate destination based solely upon his cattle. He made his major life decisions based upon his finances and based upon how it was going to bless him materially. You see, Lot should have honored Abraham. He should have maintained contact with his righteous uncle. He should not have pitched his tent toward Sodom. He should not have made an exceedingly wicked city the first thing that he saw every single morning of every single day. Lot should have taken some steps in his life, but we read in chapter 14, no longer is he dwelling outside of wickedness, but now he is living in wickedness. And when King Cheddar comes, Lot, who was before living outside and perhaps maybe just maybe could have had a chance of escape. Now he's in Sodom and his family and his goods are taken. And there came one that had escaped in verse 13. And he told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And all of a sudden, here's Abram living out in the desert, and a man comes to him with sad tidings. He begins to relay the events of the battle that has happened. And now, watch the response of Abram in chapter 4, or verse 14. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. It was his brother, or rather his nephew, that was taken captive. This same nephew that had disrespected him. The same nephew that had mistreated him. The same nephew that had preferred himself over Abraham. And yet, when the news gets to Abram, it troubles him. It bothers him to the point. The one that had selfishly picked the best looking land for himself. uh, But now he's bound and he's in captivity. And Abram's not happy with you. You see, it's, it's got to stir something inside of us when we see even a brother or sister that maybe we're not the closest to or somebody that's done us wrong or somebody that's messed with us. Uh, and now we see them in captivity. We've got a choice to make inside of ourselves. Am I going to sit back and say, well, it serves them right. I told them they shouldn't have done that. Well, look what he did to me, man. If, if Lot would have respected me, he wouldn't be in this situation. You see, in the in the spiritual sense, in the in the spiritual aspect of it, how do we respond when we see a brother or sister that's taken captive? Am I going to be smug and self-righteous? Am I going to sit back and say, man, serves him right. He shouldn't have been in Sodom. Uh, Or is something going to rise up inside of my heart? Uh, Is something going to rise up inside of me? I'm not happy about where my brother is at. I'm not happy about what he's taken in. Uh, And so I'm going to begin to engage in a battle for their soul. I'm going to begin to engage in a battle for them. 
And so he arms the servants of his house and begins to pursue after King Cheddar, all of those kings that have taken his brother. He brings back the goods and he brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and all the people. The Bible records and tells us it was not just the people, but it was not just Lot. It was all of his goods were brought back. And a curious thing happens in the next couple of verses. In verse 17, it says the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of King Cheddar and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. Now, Melchizedek, his name literally means my king is right or or more appropriately, it is the king of righteousness. He rules over Salem, which is believed to be where Jerusalem now sits. It's a city whose name means peace. It's the king of righteousness who rules in peace comes to meet Abraham. And the king of Sodom, who rules over a very exceedingly wicked city, comes to greet Abraham. The king of righteousness brings with him bread and wine to serve Abraham and his servants. You can read more about Melchizedek, who his his birth is not known. His parents are not known. He's a type. He's a shadow of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And Melchizedek begins to bless Abram. And he says, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. This is not a giving sermon, but long before the law was ever instituted, Abraham was paying tithes to a servant of the most high God. Long before the Levitical priesthood was ever instituted, Hebrews records that Levi paid tithes in the loins of Abraham. It was established long before the law of Moses ever came about. But the king of Sodom says unto Abram, watch this, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Righteousness offers him bread and wine, sustenance and favor. Wickedness comes to Abraham and says, you know what? Take all of the wealth. Just give me the souls back. I want those souls back in my city. You see, there are battles that we're going to face. And there are battles that people in this church are already facing. You see, I, I, I believe that God gave me this word. I, I don't know if it's for one person, if it's for two per people, if it's for all of us. But there is a battle that we are called to. When we see our brother caught in something and taken captive, our response is very telling. It, it is very easy. I've done it myself and I need to make sure that my heart is right. We all need to make sure that our heart is right. It's, it's easy to sit back when so-and-so stops coming to the house of God and so-and-so stops answering telephone calls or so-and-so gets engaged in this, that, or the other behavior. It's, it's very easy to sit back and, and smugly say, well, I knew they weren't going to last. I, I, I've seen it before. It's very easy to have that mindset and that thought pattern. Well, we'll see if they come back around. But something ought to rise up inside of us instead that says, no, this is not right. Uh, Now, I'm not telling you go grab all of your rifles and your pistols and your shotguns and go arm your whole house and go to war. But you should be arming your house for spiritual battle. There should be something inside of each and every one of us that is discontented. If, If I see my brother engaged, in a fault, uh, it should stir some warfare inside of me. Uh, If I see my brother taken captive or bound uh, in some manner or by some sin, it should stir something inside of me that is not content uh, to watch my brother be taken. It has to stir a desire to go. But after that battle, there will come a test. And after Abraham's great victory comes, a test. Righteousness offered him favor, but wickedness offered him distraction. It offered him goods to distract him from the souls. The enemy still tries this tactic 
because it's effective. And if you've been around any length of time, you've seen it play out even in this church. God miraculously moves and delivers somebody. God moves mightily in their lives. They get a touch of God at an apostolic altar. They might even get baptized in Jesus' name, maybe even filled with the Holy Ghost. But then uh, there's an opportunity for a distraction. The enemy comes to him and says, hey, this is a great opportunity and and your life's put back together now. You don't you don't really need to go all that in for church. And so he comes and he says, you know what? I'll give you all the goods. Just give me the souls back. Give me give me the souls. You, you don't need the souls. I, I'll take those. You just take the distraction. Abraham sees through it. And in this 21st century day, we've got to see through it. God help us if after a minor spiritual victory, we ever get caught up in the stuff and forget about the souls. God help us if as a church, we ever reach a place where we're financially comfortable, where we're, we're, it's, it's all working smoothly. We've got enough people to fill all of the positions and the slots. Uh, and the enemy can come in and offer us, you know what? We'll bless you financially. We'll bless you materially. You'll have vans in the parking lot. We'll even give you a new parking lot. Just let me have the souls. Let me have the souls of Watertown. Let me have the souls of the region. Uh, But Abraham saw through it and Abraham realized uh, it's not about material blessing. uh, It's about the souls uh, because blessed uh, are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, Blessed are they which are thirsty uh, after the mind and the heart of God uh, because the Bible says they shall be filled. They shall be filled. They will Be satisfied. So Abram says to the king of Sodom, the king of wickedness, who's trying to distract him from his purpose. He says, I have lifted up my hand to the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And I'm not taking you even a thread to a shoe latchet that I'm not taking anything that is yours, lest you should say I've made Abram rich. Abram doesn't want the king of wickedness to be able to say I've blessed him. He, he doesn't want the, the king or the enemy to be able to say, I, look what I've given you. See, when you rely totally on God, when you rely totally on the provision of God, and we don't lean to our own understanding, the Lord giveth, the Lord can take away, uh, and we can trust and we can understand that God is going to meet every single one of our needs. Not, not just for your family, but for this church. Every need that we've ever had, we don't have to worry. We don't have to turn to the things of this world because God is going to meet it. He's going to provide. He's going to take care of his kids. And then verse 1 of chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, why would God come to Abram, who's just won a battle, and tell him, fear not? Because he was afraid. This man who had just engaged in warfare, somebody under the sound of my voice, who has been hearing the tenor and the the tone of the preaching. Brother A.J. Holloway has stirred this church to heights. He's he's stirred this church to to, to engage again in battle and in warfare. Maybe your prayer over the last couple of weeks has been going to a new depth. And there's a desire inside of us to go, to possess the land, to take it. But God comes to Abram after his victory and says, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am. Am your shield. Abram was afraid uh, because he had just attacked and defeated several larger surrounding nations. Here he is. He's got a whopping 318 men and they're all his servants. And he just beat five kings. 
He went to battle and God miraculously moved, delivered him in a mighty way. But now the battle's over and now it's all said and done. And now Abraham is surrounded by enemies. You see, nothing gets the attention of the enemy more than when a little group of people rises up under the anointing of God uh, and they're stirred and convicted about the state of their brothers and sisters around them. Uh, And so they take their sword and begin to go to battle. Uh, They begin to fight. But now after that initial victory, the enemy's eyes are focused on you. And so God says, fear not, Abraham. I believe there are some in this house that it is fear that is holding us back from going to battle for this region. It's fear that is holding us back for fighting wholeheartedly for that brother and that sister that's been taken captive. Yes, there might be some that are distracted by the stuff and not the souls, uh, but there are some in this house that have a desire uh, to engage in war. You feel uh, God calling you to spiritual warfare. You feel God calling you to battle, uh, but the enemy has put a fear in our minds uh, that would tell us, if you do that, I'm coming after you. If you engage in war, I'm going to attack your family. Uh, I surround you. Uh, I've got you surrounded on all sides. I, I have you taken care of. If you go ser- if you get serious about living for God and you stop messing around with where you're at, then I'm going to come after you. But God comes to Abram and tells him, fear not. I am your shield. I believe that there are Things in our life, both spiritual and physical, that we will never know God protected us or kept us from until we reach the other side. Get the visual right now. God is his shield. Between Abraham and the enemy is an impenetrable force. God himself saying, I'll take the blows for you. I'll stand between you and the attack of the enemy. Those arrows of the enemy that are going to be flying at you. Don't worry about those, Abraham, because when the enemy comes after you, I'm your shield. I'll put myself between you and the damage. I'll take the pain. I'll take the punishment. I'll take all of the attack of the enemy and I'll be your shield. Hear me, somebody in this place right now. Do not be afraid uh, to go to the depths that Jesus is calling you to. Do not be afraid to engage to that level that God is calling you to. Uh, The enemy cannot touch you because God uh, is your shield. Uh, He is your shelter. Uh, I read from Psalms 18 and verse 1. It says, I will love thee, O Lord, of my strength. Uh, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, uh, my strength in whom I will trust. He's my buckler or my shield and the horn of my salvation uh, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. uh, And so shall I be saved from my enemies. God wanted Abraham to know, and he wants this church to know today, we can take comfort in the fact that there's a God that's fighting for us. You do not have to be afraid. Uh, You can pursue the enemy. You can go after him with all of your might. You can go after him with all of your heart. Uh, Don't get distracted by this stuff, uh, but don't be afraid to pursue because God has promised, I am your shield. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 19, it's Jesus speaking to Those that he sends out, he says, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I think a lot of times we focus on that verse in a wrong aspect. If nothing was going to hurt them, talk to Peter, Paul, Stephen, apostles, the current believers around This world. Now, if you're anything like me as an American Christian, I read that verse and the first thought that comes to my mind is, bless God, I'm never getting a sliver. 
But obviously, we've got to understand that Jesus is not talking merely about the physical. Though I believe he's a healer, though I believe there are things in my own life, physical things that God has kept me from, the power and the protection of God, this verse is not talking merely about the physical, for there is something far greater than the physical. When he's talking about serpents and scorpions, he's, he's not talking just about snakes and scorpions and a sting. And we see it played out in the book of Acts. I believe it's in chapter 28 where a, a snake latches on, or 20. He was fulfilling an account of Paul and he shakes it off in the fire. Nothing was able to hurt him for he was fulfilling and accomplishing the mission of God. Uh, But Jesus is talking about a spiritual protection. Abraham had a shield not only in the in the natural, but also in the spiritual. The I am will be your shield. The I am will protect you. But when you do battle. In the spirit realm. Because the Bible says, as we all know, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against power. When you begin to reach for your brother or sister that's walked away, God has promised to be your shield. The next verse says, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. See, we, we, we can't get a big head about God using us in spiritual warfare. We, we should be engaged in that realm. That's our reasonable service. That's the expectation. That is what God is desiring us to do. And, and we can't reach a point where we're, we've got the shield of faith and the sword and we're fighting and we're doing great things. And we get a big head and get haughty about it and begin to rejoice in the battle. That's not the victory. That's not what God has given us as our reward. He says, rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The greatest thing we could ever have is the knowledge that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And God says to Abraham, I am thy shield and I'm thy exceeding great reward. Is it enough that God is your reward? Is it enough for you to pour every ounce of energy and effort you have into the kingdom of God and never see a dime or a moment of natural blessing? But you know that your name's in the Lamb's book of life. And you know that someday you're going to have a crown of gold. And you know that he is your reward. Abraham was blessed materially, yes, but I believe God could trust him because he knew uh, Abraham was going to keep a right heart and a right mind, uh, and Abraham was going to be happy about God being his reward. When's the last time we stopped for a moment and just considered how incredibly blessed we are? I mean, God himself is my reward. I'm thankful for the house. I'm thankful for a vehicle that runs and now it has new tires and new shocks and struts. I'm thankful for that. And if God wants to bless me with with a a way to pay for that, that'd be fantastic. See, these things, yes, they might be favor. And I'm thankful for the favor of God upon material finances. But the reward always has been and always will be him. If that doesn't excite you, then we need to stir our hearts. If that doesn't, like if we can read that verse and something doesn't stir inside of us and think, ooh, my reward is him. Now, if I were to say to my wife, instead of buying her a birthday present, I would just say, well, babe, I'm your reward. That would be kind of insulting, right? Like if, if I was the reward, I'd be like, is there, you know, a new pair of boots, maybe a purse, maybe a, a detail job on the vehicle? Like what's, what's the rest of the reward? You see, humanity falls so short of it. 
And though we can be thankful for brothers and sisters, though we can be thankful for a church that we're a part of, though we can be thankful for a spouse, uh, my spouse is not the reward. Even the church is not the reward. As necessary as it is, my husband or wife is not the reward. My kids, uh, though they're a blessing from God, and I'm so grateful to have them, they're not the reward. He is. uh, He's the reward. uh, His holiness, his perfection. See, it's... It's not arrogance for God to say, I'm the reward. It's, it's arrogance for me to say, I'm the, hey, Stacy, I'm the reward. Congratulations. That's the height of arrogance and stupidity. But for a perfect, holy, lovely, gracious, good, kind, long-suffering, merciful Savior to say, I am the reward uh, should stir something inside of us. So, okay, I've reached a point. Uh, take it all, but give me my reward. Uh, you can have the house. You can have the kids. You can have uh, the 401k. You can have the wife, uh, but you can't take my reward. Uh, I'm going to hold fast to that. Uh, I'm going to grab a hold of that. Uh, And so when God wanted to tell Abraham, uh, I've got your back, he said, I'm your shield uh, and I'm your reward. Uh, If they come take all your cattle, uh, you've still got me. If they come take all your family, uh, you've still got me. If the enemy comes in uh, and wipes out everything material you have like Job, uh, we've got to reach a place of satisfaction in him alone uh, where we can say the Lord gives, uh, the Lord takes away, uh, but he's my reward uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing him forever. I am thy reward. Again, I say if we read that and it doesn't excite you, you need to stir your heart. A perfect God wants to give himself to you. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 2 goes on. And Abraham does what many of us do. God says, I'm your shield, I'm your reward. And Abraham says, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus and Abraham says, behold, you've you've given me no seed. Isn't that amazing? God says, I'm your reward. And Abraham says, what are you going to give me, God? The Lord came to him and said, this is not going to be your heir, but he that comes forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him out forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. In Romans, when Paul is retelling this in Romans chapter four, Paul writes, Abram believed God. I believe there's a distinction there where it's, it's easy to believe in the Lord. It's a little bit more challenging to believe him when he speaks But he believed in God, this exalted father, which his name Abram meant. And God shortly changes it to Abraham, which means father of many nations. And Romans chapter 4 and verse 13 gives us this. It says, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And you and I, as the sons and the daughters of Abraham, we are children of Abraham by faith. We're justified by faith. We walk by faith. We, because of our faith, our obedient faith, like the faith of Abraham, we are sons of Abraham and sons, seed of God uh, through him. This promise is for us. I believe That God is telling us in this moment, I'm your shield, I'm your reward. Look at the stars, and if you can count them, that's how many I've got for you. That's how many you can have. Count as many as you want. Number them if you can. That's what your seed will be. 
I believe there is an open door for us in this region, an open door for us in this land uh, right now. If we will stay faithful and we will stay true, if we will not get distracted by this stuff, if we'll allow God to be the shield and we'll be satisfied with him as the reward, then God is saying, uh, as the stars in the sky, that's what I've got for you. Let's stand together as I close. I am absolutely convinced there's a harvest for us. It's here. It's now. The blessing, both material and spiritual, of God is upon this church and upon these people. You are, you are not here by accident. You are here at the right time and the right moment. But fear not. Fear not to pursue God to the level that you feel him calling you. The devil can't do anything to you that God doesn't allow. He, he can't attack you in any way that God doesn't allow. And so go after him. Go after God with all your might. Allow God to work through you. Fight for your brothers and sisters that are taken. Fight for those that have walked away. Fight for those who have yet to hear the truth. Fight for that family member or that loved one that has at one point believed and now they've walked away. Do not be afraid uh, when the enemy tells you, if you go after God, I'm coming after you. God will be your shield. And God will be your reward. Let's lift our hands together in this place. Uh, God, I thank you for this group of people. I thank you, Lord, for this incredible church that I'm blessed to be a part of. I'm blessed to raise my kids in, Lord. I pray that each and every one of us would have a determination uh, and a hunger. We would have a meekness and a humility inside of ourselves, uh, Lord, to pray for those that have walked away. Not to be smug uh, and cruel, God, but stir something inside of us, Lord. I'm going after them. Uh, I'm pursuing them, Lord, because I believe you're my shield. Uh, you're my protector. You're my defense. Uh, and Lord, I pray that we would be satisfied to know uh, you are my reward. You are the one, God, uh, that I am after. And if I can ever obtain uh, and attain anything in this life, God, let it be you. Uh, let it be your glory. Let it be your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.